let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing on this. Our Father, give us thy wisdom and thy grace and the power of thy Holy Spirit, that as we see these things clearly, we may be able to go out and use them effectively to bring men and women and young people to a redemptive knowledge of thy Son, Jesus, in whose name we ask it with thanksgiving. Amen. Tonight, we're going to be studying together the subject of the Jehovah's Witnesses and specifically the texts and terms which the Watchtower quite frequently uses relative to the nature of our Lord and to the resurrection of Christ and other areas. Terms and texts which they warp, which they take out of context, which they redefine, misapply, violate all the laws of exegesis and interpretation to enforce as their doctrine, and which quite frequently confuses the average Christian. And the best way to deal with it is simply to list some of these passages and then to present them as a Jehovah's Witness would use them in your living room or when you are in dialogue with them. And then afterwards, take them one by one and attempt to put them in their proper context and analyze them linguistically so that we are able to come to their proper meaning. If we do it that way, I think it will eliminate a great many of the conflicts which might normally develop. Incidentally, someone has drawn to my attention that the Los Angeles Times has an article entitled, The End is Near. Maybe. The date is, <laughs> the date is uncertain. Jehovah's Witnesses are told. And uh, I think you ought to get a hold of a copy of this. How many of you have seen this? I think you all ought to go out and buy a copy, Monday, February 24th, 1975. Try and get a hold of it. If you can't, you should get copies made of it because it's a very revealing article by John Dart, the Times religion writer, in which he deals with the subject of the Watchtower's preoccupation with setting dates. And they set dates in 1874. They set dates in 1914. They set dates in 1918. They set dates in 1925. Then they got smart and quit setting dates until 1941 came. Then they set the date again for Armageddon in just a few months, and that didn't materialize. And now they have been pushing since 1966 the date 1975. And now that 1975 has arrived and Armageddon has not, the Watchtower Society is beginning to backpedal from 1975. And I think you'll find this particular article in the Times extremely illuminating because it explains how the Watchtower is attempting to backpedal from this particular position. You'll get a very good illustration of when in doubt, dodge. And that's exactly what you are seeing here as changes are made and people just simply seem to ignore it. But there's a lot of disenchanted Jehovah's Witnesses, and this article indicates that the disenchantment is spreading. I would suggest that you get hold of it and look it over. It's in the uh, second section uh, and part two. The end is near, maybe. Date uncertain, Jehovah's Witnesses told. But they weren't at all uncertain in the past. They've just gotten uncertain uh, recently because 1975 has arrived. Now to deal with the subject of the Jehovah's Witnesses in relation to specific texts. We have to take our Bibles and look at the passages that the Watchtower quite frequently utilizes. And then, look at the Scripture, put it in its proper perspective, and attempt to analyze it. One of the greatest problems in dealing with a Watchtower organization is the fact that they are very much like a chameleon. A chameleon, as you know, is a small lizard that always assumes the protective coloration of whatever surface on which you place it. If you put it in grass, it's green. If you put it on a building, it's brown. Put it on this rug, it becomes gold. It's very difficult to spot a chameleon simply because wherever it happens to land, it immediately assumes the protective coloration of the surface. This is exactly what we're dealing with in Watchtower theology. The Watchtower chameleon is forever with us. And if you're going to deal with it, you've got to know when the chameleon is going to change color. And you've got to put the right color down and have the contrast. So let's look at some of these passages. And I'll present these very much as if I were a Jehovah's Witness in your living room. And uh, then you can think about them as we're going along. And then we will examine these in the context of historic biblical theology. Some of the key passages the Watchtower utilizes 
involve, of course, the person, nature, and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we cite as an illustration their passages relevant to the deity of Christ. Some of these key passages you have probably read about, but probably never heard a Watchtower presentation of them. This is a Watchtower presentation. Although I will say publicly, as I have many times, contrary to what Watchtower people have stated, I have never been in any way associated with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society except in research. And the Watchtower circulated the story for years in the East where I lived that I was a disfellowshipped Jehovah's Witness and that I was demonized and that nobody should come and hear me. In those days, I weighed about 250 to 270 pounds, give or take 20 pounds, depending on the diet. <laughs> and you'd be surprised, the number of Jehovah's Witnesses that came out to listen to me, because where could you find a 270-pound demon in the flesh? <laughs> and they thought that I was a former Jehovah's Witness. They'd come up to me and say, you've got to be a Jehovah's Witness. Nobody could know all this unless you were. The answer is, do your homework, and you'll know it too. Bishop Fulton Sheen one time was asked how he could write so much on the subject of marriage in the family and family counseling when he himself had never been married. And the bishop said, you don't have to take poison to know it kills you. <laughs> you don't have to be a Jehovah's Witness in order to really master Watchtower theology. So that's what we'll do. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus Christ is the first and the greatest creation of Jehovah God, the archangel Michael, and that he does not share the nature of God. He was created by Jehovah before all worlds and raised to the rank of divinity. While he lived here on earth, he was a perfect man, the last Adam. And there are many passages which demonstrate the Watchtower's position. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 is a classic Watchtower passage. And that passage reads, Thus says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Well, who is the faithful and the true witness? The answer is found in Revelation chapter 1. So turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 1, and you can follow the Watchtower's logic. Scripture says, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth. The faithful witness is Jesus Christ. Well, if he's the faithful witness, he is the beginning of the creation of God. If he's the beginning of the creation of God, he cannot be the creator because the creator does not have a beginning. Now, we know that Jesus Christ created all things, but we know also that it was Jehovah God who created through him. That's why we find in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that Jehovah created all things through the King, Christ Jesus. By him also he made the world. So, Jesus of Nazareth is the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God, but he is not Jehovah God living in the flesh. Jehovah is only the Father, and that is specifically stated in Second Peter chapter 1. God, or Jehovah, the Father. The Son is not called Jehovah in Watchtower theology. Now, there are additional verses which can be brought to bear in this particular area. One need only look at Christ's statement in John chapter 14, verse 28, where he says, I am going to my Father because my Father is greater than I. Well, if the Father is greater than the Son, obviously Christ cannot be equal with God. That's why Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in a form of God, thought it not something to be grasped after to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a slave. So Christ Jesus did not seek to grasp for equality with God. Christ Jesus knew his position. He was the highest of all creations, chief of the angels next to the Father. And his name was Michael, who is like God, the prince of Israel, the first one, the one who stood above all others in creation. So you have Revelation chapter 3, and then, of course, you must link that immediately with Hebrews chapter 1 
And you must link it also with many other passages in the Scripture which bring these things into their proper focus. John 14.28 is only one of these. Now, many times theologians in Christendom speak of Jesus Christ as the power and wisdom of God. That is quite properly so. I cite in support of this 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Jesus is called the power and the wisdom of God. But how many people are aware of the fact that when you go back to the source of that in Proverbs chapter 8, it specifically says, Jehovah possessed me or created me in the beginning of his ways. I was set up before of old time, before all creation. Who is speaking? Wisdom. So you see, Jesus Christ, in Solomon's own words, is divine wisdom. Christ, the power and the wisdom of God, set up by Jehovah to be his chief representative, the one who would come into the world and specifically reveal his will to mankind. Now, we don't have to stop there. We can go on to many other passages. Perhaps one of the most convincing of all passages is Colossians chapter 1. So look for just a moment at what Colossians has to say. I don't think that it can be ignored. All Bible-believing Christians believe in the infallibility of Scripture. So does the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. We believe absolutely that Jehovah has inspired the Scripture and that His Word is without error. In Colossians chapter 1, we must therefore listen to what Jehovah God says. And if we do... We will learn something about Christ Jesus, which I believe is very important. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. Now, you ought to circle that word, firstborn, because if he is the firstborn of all creation, it's pretty obvious, since the word firstborn means the first one born, that he is a creature. If you check your Bible at the birth of Jesus, you will find out that Mary brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. Firstborn was who? Jesus. Again, here in Colossians chapter 1, same word. Firstborn of all creation. So Jesus was the first one born of all creation. And we should never forget the position that he occupies. Now I think that there are other things that could be said. Jesus obviously never prayed to himself. He always prayed to God. The voice of the Father came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But one of the most devastating passages in the Bible that destroys the religionists and the Trinitarian arguments concerning Jesus is found in John chapter 5, where the Scripture says, As the Father has life in Himself, so He has given the Son to have life in Himself. All right, the Father has life in Himself. We agree. And He gave the Son to have life in Himself, which means that the Son derives his life from who? The Father, Jehovah God. That's why Jesus cannot be God himself. He derived his life from Jehovah God. That's very, very clearly stated. Jesus also said, I don't know the day or the hour of my return. He didn't know who touched him in a crowd. But Jehovah knew all of these things because Jehovah is all-knowing. Jehovah is always present. Jehovah is all-powerful. But during his earthly life, Jesus was not so. Therefore, he was not Jehovah God. Philippians chapter 2 says that he was there a man who became a slave and was willing to serve Jehovah. Now, I think it's possible to go on citing many passages in the Old and the New Testament concerning Messiah. But John 1.1 brings it all together because it says 
that the Word was with God and the Word was divine or the Word was a God. And the Watchtower Society, citing other scholars, has pointed out that if the Word was divine or the Word was a God, obviously He could not be the God with whom He was. Otherwise, you would have hopeless contradiction. So Jesus is a second God. John 1.18 says in the Greek text, only begotten God. So Jesus is the only begotten God. And therefore, He is begotten by the Father before all worlds, and He is a God. This is perfectly proper for Him to be called a God, because in John chapter 10, Jesus said that the rulers of Israel were called gods and that he himself could be called son of God if they could be called gods simply because the word of God came to them. Not only do we find this in relation to the deity of Jesus, so-called, we also find many things relative to the resurrection. And I think we ought to point these things out too. Christendom teaches that Jesus rose from the dead in a physical form. The Bible doesn't teach this. Only the religious philosophers and theologians. Actually, the Bible says that Jesus rose from the dead as an immortal spirit creature and that he manufactured bodies that looked like his own body in order to inspire faith in his followers. You say, oh, but where do you prove that from the Scripture? Very simple. Mary Magdalene met Jesus after his resurrection. Did she not? She looked into his face. Did she not? She spoke with him. Did she not? Had she not been with him for the last couple of years of his ministry? Yes. Did she not know him intimately and the sound of his voice? Yes. Did she not love him? Did she not know his face? Yes. How is it then that Mary Magdalene, seeing him after the resurrection, looked upon him and supposed him to be the gardener and said, Sir, tell me where you have laid him so that I may go to him. If it was the same body that Jesus had, then Mary would have recognized him. But she didn't. Therefore, it was not the same body. Also, the scripture goes on to say that the disciples who walked on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24, when they walked with Jesus, did not know it was Jesus. Correct? Absolutely. How do we know that? Because he walked with them and talked with them and they did not know until he prayed with them and until they were breaking bread and then he revealed himself and disappeared from their sight. How can you walk with somebody? How can you talk with somebody? How can you listen to somebody? How can they preach to you? You can look at them and you cannot tell that it's a person you have known, your master, the son of God whom you've seen work miracles. The disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't know him because Jesus had a different body. Now, if you want proof of that, Mark chapter 16 proves it beyond a question of a doubt. And I'd like you to look for a second at that particular passage. Mark chapter 16. Notice it says, verse 11, When they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, Mary Magdalene, they believed not. After that, he, Jesus, appeared in another form. There it is, verse 12, right in the Word of God. In another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. Obviously, a direct reference to the road to Emmaus account as recorded in Luke chapter 24. So here is absolute biblical evidence that Jesus did not rise from the dead in the same form that hung on Calvary. Mary would have known him. The Emmaus disciples would have known him, but they didn't. And when Jesus entered the upper room, John chapter 20, the Bible says the doors were shut. Yet he appeared in the room. If he had a body of flesh and bone as hung on the cross, how is it that he could materialize 
in that room. Doesn't the Bible say flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? If so, how is it possible for Jesus to have inherited the kingdom of God? In flesh? If he rose in a physical body. So these are things we have to face. We have to face 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So Jesus was raised from the dead. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. These are arguments based on Scripture. These aren't watchtower arguments. These are biblical arguments. And if it weren't for the fact that gray-haired professors in theological seminaries teach all of the things that they teach with such professed solemnity, Christians would long ago have thrown all this nonsense out and believed what the Watchtower Society, God and theocratic organization, has been teaching from righteous evil through the present day. I thank you. <laughs> now, quite obviously, what you have heard is a forensic argument by a well-informed Jehovah's Witness, hopefully. I could argue each one of the points vigorously, being very careful to quote passages out of context so that your blood pressure would rise to four or 5,000. You would know absolutely that I was wrong, but you wouldn't know most of the time where. And so, you see, it is not only important to know what we believe, it is equally important to know why we believe it. Now we will undertake to show why the watchtower is wrong. And we have taken all of their best arguments virtually and we will submit them to the careful scrutiny of biblical theology and find out if it really will hold up. So take your Bibles and let's go through the very passages which I used and let us take the biblical position versus the watchtower argumentation. Number one, Revelation 3.14. The beginning of the creation of God. Much is made of the word beginning. Circle it in your Bible. In most modern translations, it's been corrected. It comes from the Greek word arche. And most modern translations have properly rendered it source or origin. So Jesus Christ is not the beginning of the creation of God. That is the first one. He is the origin or the source through whom all God's creation came. And that fits perfectly with Hebrews chapter 1. He created all things. He is the source, the origin of the creation of God. Cross-reference, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, if you want a good, strong argument against the watchtower at this point, I suggest that you draw their attention to the fact that in John 1.1, 1, 1, in their own New World translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures, they translated, In the beginning the Word was, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. The word translated beginning is exactly the word, arche, that is found in Revelation 3.14, and they translated in their own translation as, Beginning or origin? In the first edition of the Watchtower's translation, they translated it originally. The word was. So they used the word origin. Later on, when I pointed this out to them, they changed it from originally to in beginning. Miserable grammar. But that's the way they translated it. So the fact is, it's the same word that appears in Revelation 3.14. So if Jesus is the origin of the creation of God or the source of the creation of God, he is not the first thing created. And if they can translate it origin in John 1, we can translate it origin in Revelation chapter 3. That's a very strong argument because it comes from their own translation. Be sure and cite the translation. New World Translation Edition 1950. Edition 1950. Now, I cited a number of passages. Hebrews chapter 1 I used to support Revelation. There is no support there, but the way I used it out of context, it looked like that. I used it to prove 
that Jehovah created through Christ Jesus, and therefore I attempted to prove from that that Christ Jesus was not Jehovah God or did not share the divine nature. That was the force of my argument. However, if you go to a good modern translation, you will find that it reads this way. And I'll go to the book of Hebrews and read it to you directly out of the Greek text, which I think would perhaps be the strongest way of doing it, although most modern translations have got it as it ought to be and have uh, improved upon the King James. Actually, the Greek text tells us that the Son, verse 3, is the apogasmates doxes, the radiant outshining of God's glory, and the character stamp of his very nature. Kai character tes upastasios, which means that Jesus Christ is the very nature of God himself stamped in human flesh. How many times have you ever seen a person take soft wax and make an imprint of a coin or even a ring or something of that nature in it? You notice if the wax is the right temperature or even clay, you get an identical representation of the ring. Ancient kings used to use their signet ring, which was the only one of its kind in the world, made for them especially, to seal all documents because that was the identification of authenticity. All right, now, the writer of Hebrews, a scholar of the first water in Old Testament theology and customs, uses this illustration. He said, do you know who the Son of God really is, I will tell you. He is the impress in human flesh of the character and the nature of the invisible Jehovah. That's why Jesus could say, Have I been with you such a long time, Philip, and yet thou hast not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The whole impact of Hebrews chapter 1 is a direct opposite of what I told you as a Jehovah's Witness. The passage is really saying that Jesus Christ is the radiance of Jehovah's Shekinah and the imprint of Jehovah's character and nature stamped in human flesh, God himself living among us. Cross-reference. Colossians 2.9 For in him dwells all the fullness of God himself. Teis theotetos. Somatikos. In flesh. That's who he is. God in flesh. No way to escape those two passages. No way out whatsoever. A good Greek interlinear translation. I recommend Barry. I recommend... Uh, the one published in England, which is now available in the United States, edited by Dr. Bruce Metzger, uh, which underscores the usage of the Greek terms here. You can see it for yourself in the text. Very clear. Jesus Christ is the nature of God in flesh. There's no way to escape that passage. So far from Hebrews chapter 1, proving that the Father created through the Son, and therefore the Son isn't God, the passage is saying, the Father created through the Son who participated in the creation by virtue of the fact that He shares the nature of His Father. Jesus Christ shares and partakes of the fullness of the divine nature. Now we must use other passages in context to answer the witnesses. John 14, 28. My Father is greater than I. Jehovah's Witnesses say, there's your proof. The Father is greater than He is. Jesus said so. But if the Father is greater than He is, He cannot be God. I refer you to Jehovah's Witnesses' own translation of Hebrews chapter 1. Cross-reference Hebrews chapter 1. Where Jehovah's Witnesses 
correctly translate the scriptures for a change in relation to the nature of the angels and the Son. It says, after Hebrews 1, verse 3, Jesus Christ made a purification for our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in lofty places. So he has become better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs. The word better is the key to understanding the passage. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. The word in the Greek is kreton, K-R-E-I-T-T-O-N. The word in John 14, 28 is mezon, M-E-I-Z-O-N. Maison is the term used to compare positions in that context. The father was greater than the son. Let's not get uptight about it. Jesus became a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Philippians chapter 2 says he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave. I quoted that passage before, playing the role of a Jehovah's Witness to undermine the deity of Christ. Rather than undermining it, it demonstrates it, as is the case in many places. Because we are told here in Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus was better than the angels. That's a comparison of natures. But greater is a comparison of office. The Father was greater than the Son. Why? Because the Father was in heaven and was ruling the universe. The Son had laid aside the independent exercise of His attributes the right to act as God. And he had poured himself out and taken upon himself our form. Humbling himself as a slave, he went to the cross. And God the Father highly exalted him, bestowing upon him a name which is above every name. I think that the Christian ought to mark that passage very clearly. Gerald Ford is President of the United States. And I think it could be said without fear of contradiction that by virtue of the office which he holds, he is greater than any person in this audience. Gerald Ford would be the last man to say that he was better than anybody in this audience. Because the moment that he said the word better, everybody would know he was talking about nature's. And that's exactly what you find in Hebrews chapter 1. When you compare Jesus to the angels, you're talking about natures. Better than the angels. Why? He made them. Better than the angels? He created them. Even though positionally, you see the contrast? Positionally, he was lower than the angels. In his nature, he was what? Better than the angels. Why? He made them. But that's not true when he speaks of the Father. Jesus said, my Father is greater than I. He did not say, my Father is better than I. If he had said that, he would be inferior to the Father. And as such, he would not truly be God himself in human flesh. That's why the word was avoided. The contrast between the two words shouldn't be missed. I was very quick to use John 14, 28, and then I immediately leaped into Philippians chapter 2. You remember? All right, let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and let me show you what I leaped you over. First, I leaped you into a Jehovah's Witness argument. And the argument appears to be valid. He emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave. It's true. It also says he was found in fashion as a man. He was humiliated to the death of the cross. True. It also says in the same passage, we are to have the same mind that he had to be servants. That's true. But it says he did not think equality with God was something to be grasped for. The answer to that is quite obvious. You do not grasp after what is already yours by inheritance. Hebrews chapter 1 says, by his inheritance, he has obtained a more excellent name than they. Than who? The angels. Why? Because in Hebrews 1, 6, 
when the Father brought him into the world, remember what we learned? He said, let all the angels of God worship him. The Son is to be worshipped, not the angels. The Son. That's why John chapter 5 says, all men shall honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Whoever will not honor the Son, the same way he honors the Father, dishonors the Father, says the Gospel. It's precisely the position the Watchtower is in. It talks about Jesus and honoring him, but it dishonors him because it robs him of his rightful office. I quickly took you to Philippians 2. I read to a certain point, and then I got out of there as fast as I could. And the reason I got out as fast as I could is because, as a good watchtower follower, I knew that I would have a problem if I kept reading. So, when in doubt, dodge, invoking that sacred rule of watchtower reasoning, I left the passage immediately. I hope you didn't, because I want you to go back to Philippians chapter 2 with me and look at something that can be mutually advantageous and tremendously helpful when one is attempting to witness to a Jehovah's Witness. I'm sure that there are people saying, well, does this really do any good? You better believe it does. Does this get through to Watchtower people? Some of them. But I'll tell you what it accomplishes more than anything else. The planting of the seed of the Word of God. The piercing with the sword of the Spirit the penetration of defenses that look impregnable, but in reality are extremely vulnerable. Appearances are deceiving. Don't let the Watchtower's apparent monolithic brainwash system scare you. They have not succeeded. They have not succeeded. Men are still capable of responding to the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. My word will not return to me empty. It will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God says it will produce what he has ordained. That is biblical revelation. Dealing with the Jehovah's Witness, never forget that and never be discouraged. And stay in your context. The context is the verses before and the verses after. Look out for ripping something from its context. Dr. James Gray of Moody Bible Institute used to say, quoting Reuben Torrey, a text removed from its context becomes a pretext. And I would add to that, most generally for error. A pretext for error. And that's what you find constantly in this type of reasoning. Look now at Philippians chapter 2 in your Bible. I think you'll see this quite clearly. Notice that I stopped reading... When I got to the place where I was going to have to start quoting something that would be dangerous to the watchtower's position, I stopped quoting after verse 8. He found himself in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient as far as death. Yes, death on a torture stake. I'm quoting the watchtower's translation. For this very reason also God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. I stopped there. Very, very tactfully as a Jehovah's Witness. Because I didn't want to read the next one. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And every tongue should openly acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a direct quotation from Isaiah 45, 23. That would be very damaging. Who said it? Jehovah God. Unto me, says Jehovah, as I live, every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess. St. Paul, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, takes this and applies it to our Lord Jesus Christ and says, do you want to know who He really is? He is the Lord. He is Jehovah Himself. Now the Watchtower, believe it or not, has helped us tremendously at this point without ever recognizing that they have done so. In their own kingdom interlinear translation, 
which is a small portable ammunition dump of watchtower theology, they have stated something at the beginning which is of great value if the Christian will seize upon it. And I'd like to make reference to it because most Christians are totally unaware of it. Discussing the divine name Jehovah or Yahweh, they say, how is a modern translator to know or determine when to render the Greek word kurios and theos into the divine name in his version? By determining where the inspired Christian writers have quoted from the Hebrew scriptures, then he must refer back to the original to locate whether the divinity name appears there. This way he can determine the identity to give kurios and theos, and he can then clothe them with personality, realizing that this is the time and place for if we have followed this course in rendering our version of the Christian Greek scriptures. Close quote. Isn't that nice? They have gone back to the text and they have found where the name Jehovah appears. And then they have faithfully rendered it as kurios and acknowledged that that name in Greek is the transliteration for the Hebrew Jehovah. And here in Philippians 2, it reads in the Greek. That every knee bends and every tongue swears or confesses. Jesu Christus Curios. Capital Kappa. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God to the glory of God the Father. And they did it for us. Wasn't that thoughtful? I suggest that you point that out. If you have any difficulty in following me, don't feel too badly. Just buy the cassette and listen to it two or three times and you will have absorbed what I said. But that is precisely the form of argumentation you need. This is what blows the mind of a Jehovah's Witness who believes that this translation is the work of great scholarship. All you have to do is go to the introduction and read that, and I'll even cite the page for you so that you will have it on the tape or in your notes, and there will be no doubt whatsoever. The Watchtower has stated, they have followed the methodology that I just outlined. It's found on page 18 of the Kingdom Interlinear Translation. Code name KIT. K-I-T. And it is found in paragraph 3 and 4. They specifically make that particular admission. Then go to Philippians chapter 2 in your New Testament. And you will find in the Greek of Philippians 2, verse 10. Excuse me, 11. Every tongue shall openly acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Kurios Jesus Christos es doxen theu patros. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God to the glory of God the Father. To that statement of the watchtower, I can say, Amen. <laughs> I want to assure you that's very seldom that we can say that, that they translated that accurately. And there's right from the text itself, with their own admission, this is how it reads. That's something you don't want to forget. Now we move on to some of their other things. I was quick to add Proverbs chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Christ, the power and wisdom of God. It's a very old trick, and that's what it is. To get your mind fixed on a word, remove the word from its context and not consider the context, and then dive headlong into another context which has nothing whatsoever to do with the first one. Let's get the context correct. 
context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the identity of Jesus Christ. Power and wisdom of God. We already know from John 1, 1, he is called God in human flesh. We also know that the word logos means the reason of God. The transliteration from the targum of the Aramaic word memra for wisdom or reason. So we know who Jesus Christ is from John 1. John says he is the, the memra of God, the reason or the wisdom of God himself. There never was a time when God was separated from his wisdom any more than there could be a time when a man could be separated from his own wisdom. Obviously, if that occurred, he would cease to exist as an entity. So we have here the statement that Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Cross-reference, John 1. Logos equals memra, M-E-M-R-A which is translated from Aramaic as wisdom or as reason. Now go to the context of Proverbs chapter 8. One, there is nothing in the passage which makes it messianic. Nothing. Two, the burden of proof lies with the person who says there is. Where does it say that it is speaking of Jesus of Nazareth? Simply the word wisdom itself won't prove it. Because if you read the beginning of the passage, you'll find out that wisdom is described in the female gender. And there are no female messiahs. So it's an abstraction for wisdom. A common usage in Hebrew poetry and figurative language. To portray wisdom or knowledge or whatever they wanted to in terms of male or female gender. This is exactly what you got in Proverbs. And it's a female, not a male, so it's not messianic. That blows it up forever. Keep that thought fixed in your mind as you study the passage. The contexts are different. One is talking about abstract wisdom, philosophically, personified in the female gender. Proverbs 8. The other is talking about the identity of Messiah's divine nature, the power and wisdom of Jehovah himself. You can't put the two of them together and try and prove from these passages that Jesus is a creature. It just isn't there. In fact, quite the opposite is there. I also made very swift use of Colossians chapter 1. And I made a great show on the word firstborn, which I asked you to circle in your Bible. Firstborn of all creation. I'd like you to turn to Colossians chapter 1 for a moment. And I'd like you to remember that this passage, Colossians 1.15, should be cross-referenced to the following Old Testament verses. Genesis 41. Genesis 41. 51 and 52. And Jeremiah 31, verse 9. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. The name of the second he called Ephraim. The order is reversed in Jeremiah 31, 9. Ephraim becomes firstborn. How do you manage that? Manasseh was the first one born, and firstborn always means the first one born. Did Manasseh get unborn? Of course not. Then what does it mean? Well, the context, obviously, of Genesis is the context of the culture. What did the word firstborn mean in that culture? It meant preeminence. If a son, no matter what order he came in, was faithful to his father and his father's wishes, and his brothers who preceded him were not, he became firstborn and they lost their lineage. Manasseh apostatized, Ephraim became what? Heir to the preeminence. So the word firstborn, far from meaning always first one born, can indeed mean, particularly in a Jewish context, the preeminent one or the preeminent son. 
which is exactly what you've got in Genesis 41, 51, and 52, and Jeremiah 31, 9. Now go to Colossians chapter 1, and you find that the Scripture describing the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a perfect illustration of complete cultural congruity. There's no conflict. Listen to it. Image of the invisible God, preeminent of all creation. Why is He preeminent over all creation? For by Him were all things created. Circle the word things in your Bible. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things, circle the word things, were created by Him and for Him. 17. He exists before all things, circle the word things, and by Him all things. Thing, circle it again, hold together. He is the head of the church, the body, beginning, first born from among the dead. But he wasn't, you know. He wasn't the first one to rise from the dead. Lazarus rose first. The widow of Nain's son rose before he did. Isn't that true? Historically in time? Isn't that right? Jesus wasn't the first one born from among the dead. But he was the preeminent one to rise from the dead. Why? Because he came forth alone in an immortal body. They went back to the grave, but he went on to the throne of the eternal. Intercessor before the Father for the saints. So he is preeminent among the dead. Not because others didn't rise from the dead before him. They did. But because he alone is immortal. Death lasts. Death hath no more power over him. He dies no more. Preeminent from among the dead. We sing at Christmas time, Late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail incarnate deity. Pleased is man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Do we ever really stop and think of those words? Late in time. That's true. Behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Though late in time as David's son, He is preeminent over all the sons of David because he is creator of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Jesus turned to his antagonist after quoting that passage and said, Whose son is Messiah? And they said, David's. Jesus said, Right on. He is. How then in prophecy by the Holy Spirit does David call his son Yahweh? And everybody shut up. That was the end of the conversation. How could David's son be David's Lord? Late in time, behold him come, but preeminent over all creation. Why? By him all things were created. And when the watchtower got to this passage, they had a terrible dilemma. Really up the walls with this. Bananas. How are they going to face it? Well, there had to be a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. They took their little pens and began inserting words into the text. And here's how they did it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all other things created. They inserted the word other. In heaven and earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities of power, all other things were created by him and for him. He exists before all other things, and by him all other things consist. Four times they put the word other in there. It's not in the Greek text any place. Why did they put it in? Because by the insertion of the word other, 
tampering with the text. They made Jesus one of the things created. Other things. The secret of the passage lies in the word thing. What is a thing? A creation. A creation is that which depends upon something greater than itself for its existence. So from the greatest star in the celestial galaxies to the tiniest of all atomic substructure and antimatter. And if there's anything below that, whatever it may be, that undergirds the universe. The Scripture clearly states in this passage that all of it was held together by the Son of God. In Him all things consist because all of it was creation. And He was Creator. Now look at verse 17. He exists before all things. Now we employ a little simple logic. If Jesus Christ existed before all things, He cannot be one of the things that was created. So, if you are out of the category of things, you are in the only other category that there is. Creator. And that is precisely the Pauline argument. He exists before all things, image of the invisible God, creator of the universe. Not that the Father created through him only, but that in him everything holds together. And since he exists before everything, he's not a creature. Therefore, he is Jehovah God. Now, in John chapter 5, I immediately penetrated with the argument, old and powerful, as the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. Please notice, At this juncture, it is important to go into the doctrine of what is known in theology as eternal generation. In my book, The Kingdom of the Cults, in my book, Jehovah the Watchtower, I show that the doctrine of eternal generation is derived essentially from Catholic sources. I disagree wholeheartedly with those sources. I do not believe that Jesus Christ is eternally generated by God the Father. Because if I do, I find myself hopelessly involved in logical contradiction and I find myself defending the indefensible. If I must talk of an eternal son, I am no longer talking of a son, I'm talking of a brother. Because the term eternal son is totally ambiguous and absolutely contradictory. It is found no place within the pages of Scripture. No place. In fact, the Scripture is quite adamant that before Jesus Christ came into the world, except in prophecy, he was known as the Word or the Wisdom of God. I draw to your attention John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was deity or was God. Scripture also says, as you continue reading in the passage, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness could not put it out. Please notice that. In who was life? The Son? In the Word was life. That is why the distinction is made between John 1 and John 5, so you'll never forget it. In John 1, the eternal Word is life. In John 5, He has taken upon Himself the role of Son. And quite properly it can be said that the Father gave the Son his life. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. Hebrews chapter 1. You are my Son today. I have begotten you. John chapter 1. You are my Son today. I have begotten you. God did indeed beget a Son. 
through the Holy Spirit in the womb of the virgin. Now, in case you're thinking that this is some form of Martinian heresy, which is being hurled forth into the world for the first time, if you go back and read in the first five centuries of the Christian era, the area in which I did my doctoral studies, you will find that this is a very ancient and very old interpretation of the role of our Lord. It does not deny his eternity, it affirms it. It simply affirms that the term son is a functional term applicable to time and space and that it has no meaning in eternity. When I talk about father in eternity and I talk about son in eternity, I am talking linguistic nonsense because the only way I can recognize meaning to the terms father and son is in time and space because that's the only relationship I have to it. The Bible nowhere calls God eternal father. In Isaiah 9, 6, it calls Jesus Christ father of eternity but not eternal father. The only time the adjective eternal is applied to the Trinity is when it says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit. And God is spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what are we saying? We are saying that to argue for eternal sonship is to commit yourself to a logically indefensible position. To argue for the doctrine of the eternal word who became flesh and in the moment of that incarnation assumed the role of son of God and son of man is thoroughly defensible. There's no need for us to argue and defend Roman Catholic theology because it is bankrupt at that point. What you can defend biblically is the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. Nothing destroys the Jehovah's Witness argument against Christ's creativity faster than to smile at them benevolently and say, oh, I don't believe in the eternal Father and the eternal Son doctrine. They say, you don't? Oh, but Christendom believes that. You say, oh, no, no, not at all. There's lots of Christendom that doesn't believe that. Oh, really? What do you believe? I believe John chapter 1, in the Word was life. And in John chapter 5, the Father gave the Son life, created His body in the womb of the Virgin. So the Word is life, and He became flesh, took upon Himself our form. The Word existed from all eternity. That destroys all arguments that they have against the Son and places you squarely in the first chapter of John's Gospel, and there's no way out. They cannot backpedal from it. They just have to face it. I quoted John 1.18 to you. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. I quoted it from a Jehovah's Witness position. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. Actually, that's based upon an alternate reading of the New Testament text. And it shouldn't read the only begotten God. It should read God the only begotten one. So Jesus Christ is God only begotten. What does the word only begotten mean? Jehovah's Witnesses say only begotten from the Greek monogenes means that he was only generated, the uniquely created son. That's not the meaning of the word. Monogenes means unique, one of a kind. Jesus Christ was unique. He entered the world as the eternal word became flesh. I cannot emphasize too strongly that you make a contrast between John 1 and John 5. In the Word was life, and the Son, when He walked among us, depended on the Father for His. You remember what He said? I by my own self can do nothing. It is the Father in me. He is performing the works. He rested completely in totality upon the Father. He lived among us as a perfect man. So when you get to John 1.18, remember it. John 1.14 says the Word became flesh, so God became flesh and walked among us. But He is not only begotten Son, He is God, the only begotten One, who lived among us in perfection. Now there are many other illustrations which we could use. 
There are many passages that the Jehovah's Witnesses cite. We have covered here virtually every one of their major attacks upon the deity of Christ. I wish that we had the time in the series to go into all of their arguments on Trinitarian theology. But that would take us two or three more lectures to really do it justice. We do not have the time. The Kingdom of the Cults will have to suffice to give you some background material on that and also the tape on Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Trinity can give you a good deal of Trinitarian material which can be useful. We're going to take a break for about five minutes and then we are going to return and I will finish Jehovah's Witnesses and the resurrection and their usage of the passages which I quoted before.